हे गाइस वेलकम बैक टू डॉक्टर टीथ आई एम डॉक्टर अपनी जैन एमडीएस इन प्रोस्थोडोंटिक्स एंड टुडे वी आर गोइंग टू स्टडी अबाउट मैंडिबुलर लैंडमार्क सो लेट्स गेट स्टार्टेड फर्स्ट वी विल बी स्टडीइंग द बेसिक टाइप्स ऑफ मैंडिबुलर लैंडमार्क दिस इज द टंग द लाइट पिंक एरिया इज द रेसिडुअल अल्वेलर रिज दिस इज द वेस्टिब्यूल एरिया नाउ वेस्टिब्यूल ऑन द बकल साइड इज द बकल वेस्टिब्यूल एंड वेस्टिब्यूल ऑन द लेबियल साइड इज द लेबियल वेस्टिब्यूल This is the frenum. Frenum on the buccal side is the buccal frenum, and frenum on the labial side is the labial frenum. Now we'll be studying all the landmarks in three different categories: limiting structures, supporting structures, and relieving structures. So first we'll study limiting structures in detail. These include labial frenum, labial vestibule, buccal vestibule, buccal frenum, alveolingual sulcus. This light brown area is your alveolo-lingual sulcus. Retromolar pad. This green area is the retromolar pad. Lingual frenum. The frenum on the lingual side is the lingual frenum, and pterygomandibular raphe. We'll be studying all these limiting structures in detail now. First one is labial frenum. This is the labial frenum. It is influenced by mainly two muscles. that is incivus muscle and orbicularis oris muscle now in this picture you can see this is the incivus muscle and this is the orbicularis oris muscle at the same time labial vestibule is also influenced by various muscle that is orbicularis oris incivus and depressor labii oris muscle that is why when the mouth is opened wide sulcus becomes narrow now let's see buccal frenum buccal frenum is influenced by two muscles first one is depressor anguli oris and the second one is fibers of buccinator muscle so two muscles depressor anguli oris and fibers of buccinator muscle now in this picture this is the depressor anguli oris muscle at the same time buccal vestibule is also influenced by buccinator muscle now you need to relieve your buccal frenum in dentures otherwise it will cause displacement of denture during movement now let's see what is mesenteric notch remember guys mesenteric notch is a very important landmark or we can say it is one of the most frequently asked landmark buccal vestibule extends from this buccal frenum till retromolar pad the thickness of the buccal vestibule is influenced by masseter muscle so in this picture as you can see this over here is the masseter muscle now how is this mesenteric notch formed what happens is this is the masseter muscle what happens it gets constricted as soon as it gets constricted it will cause or it will push the buccinator muscle behind or back as you can see in this picture this is the masseter muscle and this is the buccinator muscle masseter muscle is present just in front of the buccinator muscle so what happens as soon as this masseter muscle contracts it will push buccinator muscle now as soon as this buccinator muscle will get pushed it will produce a bulge in the mouth now this bulge in the mouth will produce a notch in the denture that is bulge anything that will bulge out in the mouth will produce a notch in the denture or it will produce a notch in the impression or it will produce a notch in the cast so let's see this area somewhat over here mesenteric notch will be produced as you can see in this picture a slight notch is seen this is the mesenteric notch which is produced by the influence of the masseter and the buccinator muscle i'll just summarize it once again because of the masseter muscle construction or contraction of the masseter muscle the buccinator muscle will be pushed behind and it will cause a formation of bulge and it will be produced as a notch in the dent so that is mesenteric notch now let's see what is alveolingual sulcus this blue area is the alveolingual sulcus and it extends from the lingual frenum the frenum on the lingual side till the retromyelohyoid curtain 
and it is divided into three parts anterior middle and posterior so let's see what are the extensions the anterior part it extends from the lingual frenum till premylohyoid fossa and the middle portion it extends from premylohyoid fossa till the distal part of the mylohyoid ridge and the posterior part it extends from the mylohyoid ridge till the retromylohyoid fossa or you can say that the posterior part is also known as lateral throat form now this lateral throat form is produced as a s shaped curve in the denture and it is very important this s shaped curve is produced by the influence of various extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue that is why during impression making the patient is being asked to do various tongue movements so that the alveolingual sulcus or the posterior portion of alveolingual sulcus can be recorded as i have already told you posterior part of the alveolingual sulcus produces a s shaped curve the middle part that is from the premylohyoid fossa till the distal end of the mylohyoid ridge this region is shallower than the other parts of the sulcus this is due to the prominence of the mylohyoid ridge and the mylohyoid muscle this is the mylohyoid muscle because of the action of the mylohyoid muscle this area is shallower how does this happen when the movements take place the mylohyoid muscle moves up and down and because of that this area the middle portion of the sulcus is shallower now the posterior region or the lateral throat form is bounded by various muscle anteriorly this muscle is bounded by the mylohyoid muscle so somewhere here your posterior region or lateral throat form will be present and anteriorly the front part is bounded by the mylohyoid muscle laterally it is bounded by the pear shaped part laterally this is the lateral aspect and so and somewhere over here is the pear shaped part so laterally it is bounded by the pear shaped part posterior laterally it is bounded by superior constrictor muscle so this is the superior constrictor muscle and this is the posterior part so posterior laterally it is bounded by superior constrictor muscle posterior medially it is bounded by the tongue and the muscle of the tongue palatoglossus so this is the posterior part and medial part so posterior medially it is bounded by palatoglossus muscle and the tongue now retromylohyoid fossa this blue portion is the retromylohyoid fossa and it is present posterior to the posterior to the mylohyoid muscle this is the mylohyoid muscle and posterior to the mylohyoid muscle is the retromylohyoid fossa it is the posterior part of the alveolingual sulcus let's talk about retromolar pad retromolar pad is present behind pear shaped pad lot of people get confused between pear shaped pad and retromolar pad they are different distal to the tooth is the pear shaped pad and behind pear shaped pad is the retromolar pad it is a collection of loose connective tissue with mucus gland and it is a non keratinized pad of tissue the denture should extend 2/3 over the retromolar pad it should not cover the full retromolar pad it should cover only 2/3 of the retromolar pad so let's see what are the boundaries of retromolar pad boundaries of retromolar pad are posteriorly temporalis muscle so see this is your retromolar pad over here posteriorly somewhere here is your temporalis muscle so posteriorly it is temporalis muscle laterally this is the lateral aspect now laterally it is the buccinator muscle this is the buccinator muscle and laterally laterally it is the buccinator muscle medially it is the pterygo mandibular raphe and superior constrictor muscle so as you can see in this picture this is the superior constrictor muscle and this is the pterygo mandibular raphe so it is present medially to the retromolar pad in this picture this is the pear shaped pad and this is the somewhere over here is the retromolar pad and this is the denture that is covering 2/3 of the retromolar pad and these are the different boundaries posteriorly it is temporalis laterally it is buccinator 
and medially it is superior constrictor muscle and pterygomandibular wrap. Let's see what is pterygomandibular wrap. In this picture as you can see, this is the pterygomandibular wrap. Now you can see that there are two muscles that are seen in the pterygomandibular wrap. This is the, over here it is the buccinator muscle and over here this is the superior constrictor muscle. So by this picture you can say that pterygomandibular raphe is formed by insertion of two muscles. Buccinator muscle and superior constrictor muscle. So pterygomandibular raphe is formed by two muscles, superior constrictor muscle, posteromedially. This is the posterior part and the medial part. Posteromedially, it is formed by superior constrictor muscle. And anteromedially, it is formed by buccinator muscle. Anterior part and lateral part. So, anterolaterally, it is formed by the buccinator muscle. Now, let's see what are the different mandibular supporting structures. First one is residual alveolar ridge. Second one is buccal shell fading and the various relief structures are genial tubercle mylohydrate. Now buccal shelf area. This is the buccal shelf area. Now buccal shelf area in this picture as you can see this is the buccal shelf area. Now buccal shelf area does not resolve easily. Why does it happen? Because the occlusal forces that act on it act perpendicular or act at 90 degree to buccal shelf area. So that is why it does not resolve easily. And that is why it is a stress bearing or load bearing area. Boundaries of buccal shelf area are external oblique ridge, this black line, crest of the alveolar ridge, this and your retromolar pad. So distally retromolar pad laterally crest of the alveolar ridge and laterally external oblique ridge. Residual alveolar ridge. As you can see in this picture, this is the residual alveolar ridge. Now residual alveolar ridge in mandible resorbs outward in the outward direction. That is why Mandible becomes wider and wider due to resorption. The various relieving structures are genial tubercle. This, in this picture, this, this is the genial tubercle. Now, because of continuous resorption, what happens is these tubercle they come closer to the crest of the ridge. Because of that, it causes impingement or pain at the time of denture insertion or when load is applied onto the denture. How can you avoid all this? We'll be studying in future. Similarly, mylohydrate. Because of continuous resorption, the mylohydrate comes close to the crest of the ridge. And because of continuous insertion and removal of the danger, this area gets traumatized. That is why you need to relieve this area. So let's just quickly summarize. This orange area is your vestibule area. The vestibule on the buccal side is the buccal vestibule. The vestibule on the labial side is the label vestibule. This is the buccal frenum. This is the label frenum. This is the crest of the alveolar ridge. This red area is the buccal shelf area. It does not resolve easily because the forces act at 90 degree. Or the occlusal forces are at 90 degree to the buccal shelf area. This green area is the retromolar pad. This light brown area is the alveolar sulcus and it is divided into three parts anterior, middle and posterior. The various stress bearing areas are buccal shelf area and residual alveolar ridge. Limiting structures are is the vestibule, the frena, labial and the buccal frena, the retromolar pad and the alveolar sulcus and the relieving structures is the mylohyde ridge and genial tuber. Thank you so much guys for attending this session. I hope you all liked our session. See you all next time. Until then, stay safe.